SpaceX team is working around the clock at the Starbase to complete the remaining activities before the highly anticipated orbital test flight of Starship. Let's dive right in and see how the team is pushing the boundaries of space exploration with their unparalleled speed and dedication. Starship 24 is currently at the Rocket Garden, and teams have installed all the thermal protection system tiles necessary for the test flight. Andrew from Rocket Future recently spotted teams working around the flight termination system of Ship 24. A flight termination system is a safety mechanism used in rockets to ensure public safety if the launch vehicle goes out of control or off course during its flight. The system is designed to destroy the rocket in flight by triggering an explosion in case it poses a threat to populated areas, critical infrastructure, or national security. The flight termination system is usually controlled by a remote ground station or an onboard computer that monitors the rocket's trajectory and status during the flight. The installation of the flight termination system indicates that all the pre-launch checkouts for Ship 24 have been completed and the vehicle is ready for flight. Booster 7 is currently stationed at the launch site and no major work has been done on the vehicle for the past two weeks. It looks like the booster was removed from the orbital launch mount only to complete the remaining work on the launch mount. What is currently holding back SpaceX from announcing a launch date are the work that remains on the launch mount, installation of the water deluge system, and the FAA launch license. In a recent tweet, Elon Musk said that assuming the launch license takes a few weeks, a launch in April is highly likely. Before the launch can take place, Ship 24 will need to be transported back to the launch site, and Booster 7 must be mounted on the orbital launch mount. The next step will be a full stack, and only then will there be more clarity on the path to the launch date. The orbital launch mount received its final protective shielding last week. The shields will protect the launch mount piping, manifolds, control panels, and other components from engine exhaust and debris during liftoff. The doors installed on some of the shields will ensure workers can continue to access essential parts inside the launch mount. The construction of the six launch mount legs on which the launch platform rest was completed in mid-2021. The legs were filled with rebar and concrete after construction, but the vertical extensions installed above them were hollow until last week. All this time, SpaceX had done nothing to strengthen them. A few days ago, teams installed concrete injection ports on the leg extensions and began pumping concrete into them. The vertical extensions are currently the weakest parts of the launch mount, but that problem will be solved once all the extensions are filled with concrete. SpaceX conducted the first cryogenic proof test of Starship 25 at the company's Massey's test facility last Tuesday night. It was the first time a Starship pre-launch test was conducted outside the launch complex. The footage of the test from Lab Padre is not very clear because the test site is located several kilometers away from Starbase and the test took place at night. But still we can see that SpaceX filled the methane tank of the ship almost half with cryogenic liquid nitrogen during the test. Since SpaceX owns the road that leads to Massey's from Highway 4, no road closure is necessary to conduct Starship testing there. We can expect more Ship 25 testing in the coming days, so don't forget to keep an eye on the Labpodre Raptor Roost Cam that tracks tests at Massey's. Starship 26 was moved to the Rocket Garden on March 19 to make room inside the high bay for Starship 28 stacking operations. Ship 26 is currently attached to a crane at the Rocket Garden, and teams are preparing to lift the prototype onto a Raptor installation stand. Ship 26 has already completed two cryogenic proof tests, and once all six engines are installed, SpaceX will begin Ship 26's static fire tests. The common dome of Starship 28 was moved into the high bay last Monday evening. On early Wednesday morning, the nose cone payload bay forward dome assembly of Ship 28 was stacked atop the common dome section. This is a new stacking pattern for SpaceX. Before Ship 28, SpaceX stacks the forward section atop the tank section to complete Starship's primary structure. Ship 28 is the first Starship prototype to be stacked in a top-down pattern. The methane tank section of Super Heavy Booster 10 was moved into the Mega Bay on March 18. The methane tank was lifted with the help of an overhead crane and stacked atop the oxygen tank section on Wednesday morning, effectively completing the primary structure of Booster 10. Booster 10 is the eighth fully stacked Super Heavy prototype. Next to Booster 10 inside the Mega Bay is Booster 9, which is currently receiving its 33 Raptor engines. Teams have also begun stacking the ring section of Booster 11 inside the Mega Bay. Now, let's discuss some of the biggest updates in the world of science and technology from the past week. Terran 1, a 3D printed rocket designed and built by Relativity Space, failed shortly after lifting off from a launch pad in Cape Canaveral on Wednesday, March 22. 
The test flight, dubbed Good Luck Have Fun, lifted off from Launch Complex 16 on Wednesday evening, after two scrubbed countdowns earlier this month. Since it was a demonstration mission, the rocket was not carrying a functioning payload. Instead, it carried a small aluminum alloy ring to space, which was one of the first metal 3D prints Relativity made using its first generation of 3D printers. Terran 1 performed well initially, for example, it passed Max-Q, the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure, 1 minute and 20 seconds after liftoff. Max -Q. Relativity has stated that passing this point of the flight will prove the structural integrity of the 3D printed rocket under the most extreme conditions it is expected to encounter during flight. We just completed a major step in proving to the world that 3D printed rockets are structurally viable. The first and second stages separated successfully 2 minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff, but something went wrong shortly after that. The second stage was supposed to coast 6 seconds after separation before igniting its single vacuum-optimized Eon engine. However, despite visual indications that the engine ignited, no useful thrust was produced, and the upper stage failed to enter the intended orbit. Relativity said that more details about the anomaly would be announced later. But maiden launches are always exciting and today's flight was no exception. Although we didn't reach orbit, we significantly exceeded our key objectives for this first launch. And that objective was to gather data at max Q, one of the most demanding phases of flight, and achieve stage separation. Our team will now carefully analyze this data to determine what led to this outcome. The mission, despite failing to enter orbit, was an important breakthrough for relativity space and helped demonstrate the viability of its ambitious manufacturing approach. Relativity believes its 3D printing approach will make building orbital class rockets much faster than traditional methods. The company aims to create rockets from raw materials in as few as 60 days. Relativity Space is already making progress on its much larger next-generation launch vehicle, Terran R. It is expected to be a fully reusable launch system with an anticipated payload capacity of 20,000 kg to low Earth orbit. Terran R's first launch is currently planned for no earlier than 2024. Please watch my previous videos to learn in detail about Terran 1 and Terran R rockets. Links in the description. Blue Origin has completed and released its findings from the investigation of its NS-23 in-flight anomaly. Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket suffered an anomaly during an uncrewed space mission on 12 September last year. The mission wasn't carrying any space tourists on board, instead, it was a cargo flight that aimed to take 36 payloads on a brief tour to suborbital space and back. The launch appeared to be going as expected until about T plus 1 minutes. However, at an altitude of around 8,500 meters, the plume from the hydrogen-fueled VE3 engine that powers the rocket changed its appearance, and the vehicle began to swerve slightly off vertical. The capsule's launch abort motor activated instantly, generating a quick pulse of thrust to propel the craft away from the failing rocket. The capsule reached a peak altitude of about 11.4 kilometers and then stabilized itself as it deployed three drogue parachutes and three main chutes for a relatively gentle ride back to the ground. The capsule touched down near the launch site about five and a half minutes after liftoff. More than six months after the incident, on March 24, Blue Origin released its findings in the company website. The direct cause of the mishap was a thermostructural failure of the engine nozzle which caused off-axis thrust and activated the crew capsule escape system. The crew capsule escape system worked as designed, bringing the capsule and its payloads to a safe landing with no damage. As part of the response to the crew capsule escape, the propulsion module commanded the shutdown of the booster's BE-3PM engine and followed an unpowered trajectory to impact the ground within the designated hazard area. Testing of the damaged engine began immediately following the mishap and found that the nozzle operated at hotter temperatures than previous design configurations. Forensic evaluation of the recovered nozzle fragments showed clear evidence of thermal damage and hot streaks, resulting from increased operating temperatures. The mishap review board determined that design changes made to the engine's boundary layer cooling system accounted for an increase in nozzle heating and explained the hot streaks present. Blue Origin is currently implementing corrective actions, including design changes to the engine combustion chamber and operating parameters. The company expects to return to flight soon, with a reflight of the NS-23 payloads. The commercially manufactured robotic moon lander, Hakuto-R, slipped into lunar orbit on March 21, more than three months after its launch. Developed by Tokyo-based iSpace, Hakuto-R Mission 1 was launched atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket on December 11 last year. After traveling into a long-duration fuel-efficient ballistic lunar transfer trajectory that took it 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, 
the spacecraft swung back to rendezvous with the moon earlier this month. After a lengthy burn by its main engine, the spacecraft entered lunar orbit on March 21 at 1.24 a.m. UTC. Entering the lunar orbit is the seventh of 10 milestones iSpace set for the mission that started with launch preparations. If all goes well, the spacecraft will descend to the floor of Atlas Crater in late April, making it the first fully commercial lander to do so. Once on the lunar surface, the lander will deploy the United Arab Emirates Rashid rover and an experimental robot known as the Japanese Lunar Excursion Vehicle. The 10 kg Rashid rover is designed to study the moon for 14 Earth days, using a set of scientific instruments. Two high-resolution cameras, a microscopic imager, a thermal imager, a probe designed to examine electrical charges on the lunar surface, and other tools are all part of the rover's arsenal. The 80mm wide 250 grams Japanese transformable lunar robot will deploy tiny wheels to roll across the lunar surface and collect data and imagery. The data it collects will aid in designing a future pressurized rover to transport astronauts on the lunar surface. iSpace plans to launch two more robotic missions to the lunar surface in 2024 and 2025. After successfully conducting back-to-back -back launches from their recently inaugurated U.S. launch site, Rocket Lab returned to its launch complex in New Zealand on March 24, sending an electron launch vehicle into space. The mission, dubbed the Beat Goes On, carried two Earth-observing satellites owned by Seattle-based company Black Sky into a low-Earth orbit. Stage separation occurred two minutes and 30 seconds after liftoff, and the booster returned to Earth under a parachute and performed a soft splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. A recovery vessel retrieved the booster from the ocean for transport back to Rocket Lab's production facility in Auckland to determine if boosters that do splashdown can be reused. If that is the case, the company will no longer need to perform mid-air recoveries of boosters using a helicopter, a method that they unsuccessfully attempted in two launches last year. 54 minutes after liftoff, the Electron Kick stage deployed the two Black Sky satellites into a 450-kilometer low-Earth orbit. With the successful deployment, the number of satellites in the Black Sky constellation increased to 16 out of a planned 60. The Black Sky constellation provides customers real-time geospatial intelligence and monitoring services across the globe, with a spatial resolution of 1 meter at an altitude of 500 kilometers. Friday's mission marked the 35th total flight of the Rocket Lab's two-stage electron launcher and the third mission of 2023. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.